Good evening, everyone. My name is Alan Malik. I am the Executive Vice President and Chief Pharmacy Officer at the Ontario Pharmacists Association. And I'd like to welcome everyone online for this pharmacy profession update. Uh, and specifically, we are going to be talking over the next hour about changes that have been going on in the pharmacy space uh, with regards to budgetary changes, as well as uh, some perhaps some elements around scope of practice. Joining me in the room uh, today is our new CEO, Justin Bates, as well as the as chair of the board, Jen Baker. And just before we get started, I would like to uh, first outline a little bit of the format that we are gonna take this evening. We're gonna treat this, uh, this presentation a bit more in a podcast form of, of framework, where it's gonna be a bit more of a, of a, a question and answer dialogue uh, between myself, uh, Justin, and Jen. Um, and we will, uh, I will, will ask all participants to, uh, to hold their questions. Uh, we will be looking at, at all questions at the end of the presentation. So just some housekeeping. Uh, as you will see on your screen, there will be uh, on, most likely at the bottom of your screen, there will be on the taskbar a section for questions and answers. Uh, and I will ask uh, all of our participants online, and if you'd like to use, uh, like to ask a question, to use that uh, that button on the taskbar. Uh, you can ask a question at any time, but we will be responding during the second half of this webinar to the questions. We recognize that there are many people online, and we will try to get to as many of the questions as we can. Rec and if we can't get to uh, to your specific question, we will be addressing those in an ongoing Q and A uh, that we will be posting online on the OPA website. Uh, please note also that uh, all attendees' uh, microphones are all muted, and that's simply due to the numbers of people online. Uh, we'd ask your participation at the end of the webinar if you could take uh, a few short minutes to complete an evaluation of this particular session. This webinar is being recorded and the recording will be made available, uh, hopefully uh, in the next several days, uh, hopefully even at the end of this week, uh, we'll get this to you as quickly as we can. One final note before we get started is that if you are having any technical difficulties uh, associated with uh, uh, the webinar and listen and hearing, uh, there is a number at the bottom of your screen on the slides uh, and we'd ask you to, to contact that number if, if, as I said, you are having any difficulties. Okay, so we are gonna get started. And um, before, uh, uh, before we get into the podcast dialogue format, Justin, perhaps it would be a good idea for you to kick things off with some uh, initial context that perhaps has led us to the discussions with the government, and if you can also follow that with uh, an overview as to where we've come over the last uh, last several months. Great, thank you, Alan. And first and foremost, let me start off by saying uh, it's a great pleasure to be able to speak directly to to the members. And our objectives today are really to provide the background and context, uh, the what, the how, the when, and what's next to what has transpired over the last uh, several months. I think it's, it's important to start us off by saying that OPA does not advocate for, nor are we uh, pleased with any reductions to pharmacy, uh, the profession. And we were uh, greatly disappointed back in April when the table was set uh, uh, sorry, when the budget was tabled on April 11th, and like everyone else in the industry, we were blindsided by the uh, announcements that were contained in the budget 2019. The subsequent uh, regulations that were tabled uh, on April 24th uh, really produced a lot of concern uh, for us, and uh, we established uh, an ad hoc working group between uh, Neighbourhood Pharmacy Association of Canada and the Ontario Pharmacists Association to uh, examine the impacts of each of the measures that was uh, being uh, introduced. Uh, and we uh, determined that we needed to set up a more formal and ongoing dialogue with government to express our concerns and to highlight and underscore the 
uh, risks and potential unintended consequences from what was being proposed. It is never uh, a good scenario when uh, we are seen as a soft target by uh, payers and in particular when uh, money is coming out of, of our system. Our collective challenge and what the opportunity is for us uh, over the next two to three years is to uh, flip that narrative uh, and to not only develop the trusted relationship with government, but to be seen both at a grassroots uh, level and perspective, as well as by payers for being a part of the solution that uh, we need to collectively work together on, uh, both as a profession and as government to develop solutions and be part of uh, a sustainable healthcare system. We have great opportunities as a profession to unlock uh, the expertise of pharmacists who are the most highly accessible healthcare providers trusted by patients uh, year over year by opinion polls, and certainly the opportunity to create capacity in the healthcare system by uh, leveraging our high accessibility in communities across the province. That said, we are in a cycle, um, certainly, of reductions. Um, every, every few years, regardless of government, uh, we tend to be one of the low-hanging fruits in terms of targeting for reductions. And part of that is uh, certainly a responsibility by the associations to initiate a, a more sustainable and ongoing public relations campaign to mobilize both the grassroots from a patient perspective and connecting our story with the MPPs and decision makers about what value we bring to the healthcare system. Uh, with all of that uh, being said, uh, our determination in meeting with government uh, in the early uh, days in May after the budget was tabled, uh, our judgment from staff's perspective and sitting across the table from government was that there was a high probability and conviction on the part of government to achieve savings, not just for pharmacy, but across all government sectors. I think it's fair to say that there's uh, very much an austerity uh, budget uh, that was put in place. And we felt uh, and continue to feel that uh, by walking away from the table or by presenting any significant protest uh, uh, and not having that ongoing dialogue, we would likely see the scenario that was presented in the budget being implemented, which uh, in our view would be a much more negative impact to the collective uh, profession and pharmacies. Uh, and we wanted to first and foremost uh, introduce and express our concerns to government while working on alternatives. Our number one objective was to try to table, uh, permanently park all of the initiatives and work on a more sustainable reimbursement framework uh, as it became clear the government was committed to moving forward with these initiatives, our focus became uh, more of a risk mitigation uh, approach to try and uh, mitigate not only the uh, reductions, but come up with uh, a strategy that would buy us time and a runway to negotiate a longer term agreement that will bring predictability, uh, sustainability and certainty into our profession. We acknowledge that there is uh, significant uh, dissatisfaction with the current agreement and that there are a number of priorities that we need to ensure in the long term that we're not sacrificing in the short term. That being said, um, we needed to come up with alternatives and we worked with the broader community to uh, implement a risk management approach so that we weren't moving forward with short term measures that would have long term impacts. Specifically, we were very concerned about the administration fee that was being proposed, which would set a precedent uh, within the private payer sector, as well as potentially other jurisdictions and public plans. And the tiered markup presented both opportunity and risk with respect to the uh, both the low end of the markup uh, and the high end. Um, we acknowledge that we need to sit down in a collaborative effort to come up with a more modernized reimbursement model that uh, certainly recognizes the value pharmacy brings to the table, but we felt that this wasn't the right model to move forward with. In addition to the tiered markup, there was a capitation model being uh, introduced to uh, long-term care. And I want to assure everybody that we presented a very strong argument uh, against capitation. Um, had that said, while we argued that there were significant risks in a, a very different care model for long-term care, and the comparators to other provinces was not an apples to apples comparison. It became very clear that the government was committed to forcing that business model change. 
uh, in the early days of our discussions with government in the spring and summer, we introduced the concept of a reconciliation method. The reconciliation method is essentially a clawback that um, achieves a certain savings target for government, while at the same time uh, allowing us some time to continue the discussion over uh, establishing a more long-term uh, agreement. Um, we did offer that same reconcili reconciliation method for community uh, to long-term care, um, and there were debates amongst the community with respect to whether or not um, the reconciliation method was a fair uh, fair for each of the community, each of the pharmacy sectors. Um, the, the challenge we faced was that the government had targeted certain dollar amounts for each of the sectors for uh, claims above a thousand, claims below a thousand, as well as long-term care. So we wanted the reconciliation method to be fair, transparent, and reflect those savings targets. Um, in doing so, the long-term care sector formed a coalition and opposed that tiered uh, reconciliation method and uh, was hoping to avoid any of the reductions by uh, forming the coalition. As you can see from where we're at today, the government was committed and continues to be committed to the capitation model, thereby posing the same risk for us if we had uh, opposed the reconciliation for community in that we would likely be uh, stuck with what was proposed, uh, the measures proposed in the budget, which would have amounted to close to $800 million of uh, dollars coming out of our, uh, coming out of our industry. That part of this process was also to ensure that we continue to have dialogue and uh, be at the table with government uh, so that we can not only monitor and evaluate the impacts of the implementation of the both capitation model long-term care and the reconciliation method for community, but also that we, we need to address some of the underlying challenges that we face as a profession. We have a commitment with the Ontario College of Pharmacists to uh, address and uh, investigate and explore solutions around workplace uh, issues that have been uh, certainly a diversity of thought out there and expressed uh, in various forums, as well as to ensure good policy is implemented around private label generics and ordinary commercial terms and that we uh, achieve funding for scope of practice like common ailments. All of these things are top priorities for our association as we move forward. And to do those things and be successful, we need to maintain a positive relationship with government uh, and, and certainly be a collaborative partner in delivering on some of these uh, challenges. Certainly that doesn't change the fact that we've expressed the risks and unintended consequences. And uh, I think we have to continue to look forward to the next three years, which essentially is the runway we have with the reconciliation method. There's also an acknowledgement that we need to uh, improve and revamp the MedCheck program, whether that is evolving it into transitions of care or other elements. And that is our commitment uh, as well as part of this process. Uh, to preserve the MedCheck program was important as a signal that there's no walk back on scope of practice. And as we talk about the other elements of scope of practice, we can leverage uh, the work we are undertaking with the ministry, um, both from a monitoring and evaluation perspective, but also in developing a new uh, longer term agreement uh, that's sustainable for, for all parties. Now, I would say that if we look at some of our history uh, in opposing governments, and uh, we certainly have recent history in 2010 of uh, protesting and aligning uh, the industry against government, and uh, it took us a better part of uh, a decade to overcome that reputationally and to be back at the table with government. While we certainly have leverage points, we are certainly not in the position of strength when it comes to who holds the hammer when it, uh, for policy and reimbursement. And that ultimately has to be recognized in where we position ourselves uh, with government. So with that, I would like to bring in uh, Jen to have some perspectives from a pharmacist perspective and talk a little bit about both the MedCheck program and uh, some of the operational elements. Absolutely. Thank you, Justin. Um, so in looking at the overview of um, the, the changes that are coming from a pharmacist perspective, I think that one of the questions that might be asked is, is how might this actually affect a practicing pharmacist day to day uh, in your workplace? And um, I, I think at this point, it's probably too early to comment on uh, what the, uh, the changes to the funding model might look like in individual practices or businesses. Uh, however, 
with the preservation of the existing model, with the preservation of meds check, with eliminating the potential of a transaction fee, um, really from a day-to-day -day workflow perspective, very little should actually change. Uh, we're still able to deliver the meds check program to our patients um, to provide that clinical service. And I think that's an extremely important precedent. Uh, in discussing this, um, we've heard from many pharmacists, uh, both pro and con on the meds check program. We understand that currently the documentation that exists is extremely rigorous. It's very rigid. Um, we are working with software vendors to ensure that all software vendors are incorporating the forms and documentation into their programs to help enable pharmacists to perform the documentation more quickly. But I think the important thing about all this is that in moving forward, as Justin mentioned, with that ongoing uh, discussion with government around the MedsCheck program, by keeping it status quo for now, but committing to, um, to perhaps relaxing some of that rigorous documentation, we can help pharmacists focus on the value that's provided uh, by the meds check and not just on the documentation itself. So I'm very hopeful um, to what that will look like in the future. Uh, I understand that um, there may be some concern around um, the preservation of meds check as it stands, but I think that the elimination of that program would have been a very unfortunate precedent to be set because it does, uh, it, MedsCheck does recognize the clinical value of the pharmacist in providing that cognitive service. And that is definitely not something that we want to walk backwards from. So um, as we move forward to working with government, uh, we don't know what that will look like yet in terms of how we collect that input on the MedsCheck program and the data that we collect, but already we're hearing from pharmacists wanting to contribute your data and your input. Um, and we encourage members uh, to continue to think about what that might look like because ultimately um, we are going to be seeing changes at the end of this three-year period where MedsCheck is, uh, is status quo currently. So um, I'll move on from MedsCheck to perhaps the framework for the discussions. Uh, one of the other sort of questions that I've seen um, float out there um, in, in the social media space, and I'm sure many of you are thinking about it, is this, um, this outcome um, is in agreement with government. And pharmacists may say, well, you know, how is this an agreement? I, I wasn't consulted. Um, I, who were they talking to? So this webinar, um, is to provide some transparency around um, that because throughout the process of this negotiation between uh, the Ontario Pharmacists Association and neighborhood pharmacies, a non-disclosure agreement was in place and it was a non-negotiable part of the agreement with government um, to, uh, to allow for these discussions to go forward. And uh, we, we definitely wanted to be as open and transparent with our members about what was going on throughout the process because we understand that it makes a material difference to your practices and to your businesses. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to disclose any of the progress or what was going on until an agreement was reached. Um, and any of you who have engaged um, in a business transaction where sensitive information is shared uh, will understand the importance of a non-disclosure agreement to protect both parties in those scenarios. Um, so, so this element of the, the agreement was essential and um, you know, not being able to share that information in the moment um, was, was not ideal, but it was essential to moving forward towards this outcome. Um, so one of the, uh, principles that um, we were very pleased to see was that there was a willingness from the Ontario government to find alternative methods to finding savings, that um, they were open to discussing with um, advocacy groups such as the Ontario Pharmacists Association and neighborhood pharmacies to, to listen to what we had to say and to engage with us to find ways to achieve savings um, that didn't necessarily have to be committed to the regulations that were initially tabled. Uh, this isn't something that we've seen in a very long time. So that willingness to work with us uh, is a very positive um, step forward in pharmacy advocacy in Ontario. Um, 
I've spoke to the non-disclosure and agreement and the, the importance of that. Um, but ultimately that sharing of data was critical to verifying assumptions and to um, clarifying any perhaps misperceptions around the model um, so that we could come up with uh, proposals that uh, actually could be implemented because they were based off of solid data. Um, then a pharmacy table um, that was comprised of pharmacy profession representatives from all the different from the different sectors of pharmacy um, was formed so that we could help deliver solutions. And then the recognition of whatever agreement that was derived, um, it would be a short term solution so that we could address the longer term um, pharmacy reimbursement model uh, and create something that is sustainable for, for the profession of pharmacy. So we know that uh, reconciliation isn't going to be the long-term way forward, uh, but it does allow us that runway, as Justin said, to go to the table to look at solutions and to come up with ways that we can continue to put our patients first in a financially sustainable way and deliver the care that Ontarians need from their pharmacists. So, Jen, um, maybe you can expand. You, you just uh, you just said uh, in terms of the principles that were established uh, that set up the conversations that a non-disclosure agreement uh, was essentially non-negotiable. That that was one of the criteria for OPA and neighborhood pharmacies to be sitting at the table with the ministry. Knowing what we've what we've gone through in the past over the past several years, we've had previous experience with a non-disclosure agreement that effectively ties the hands of the association, especially in terms of trying to communicate with with our members in terms of what's going on. Why why would we sign it? Why you know, why would we enter into a non-disclosure agreement? And why is sitting at the table with the government so important? Um, well, I, I think that in this case, with it being a non-negotiable, um, you know, in my view, really, this does protect both sides going in. You know, the sharing of data is critical to these sorts of discussions. But the alternative was to walk away. And I think that um, what we all need to recognize is that 800 million, I'm rounding up, but the 791 million that the government had tabled in their regulations is an extremely real number. And we were absolutely facing those levels of cuts in the method that the government had proposed should we have walked away and not signed that agreement. Um, so it was ultimately determined by the, uh, the leadership on the boards and the staff at the, the various uh, groups who engaged in the pharmacy table that signing this non-disclosure agreement was worth the risk because we had everything to lose. Um, and potentially a lot to gain by signing this. It did tie our hands in terms of communication, but we're now able to communicate the results and ultimately um, the non-disclosure agreement protected the discussions and those negotiations. And that is what they were. Uh, they were they were negotiations with government where you know data was exchanged, proposals were put forward, uh, compromises were made. Um, essentially the, the definition here of a negotiation, right? Um, and it, in having that, we were able to achieve a reduction um, in the savings and preserve uh, some very important precedents for our profession. And while it may not have been 100% win where we got everything that we wanted, uh, ultimately, this is a better outcome than what we would have been facing if we had walked away from that table. Um, once again, being, being partners uh, in this and, and looking for solutions is so critical moving forward because if we aren't at that table, outside forces will determine our future. They will determine what our practice looks like, what our businesses look like. And ultimately we, we, we can't allow that to happen. We, we need to remain engaged. We need to remain um, at, that ta at the table with government. And we do that by creating those relationships and by, by being a trusted partner. And, and that's part of what that agreement and, and that non-disclosure agreement um, really was. Thanks. Thanks. Justin, any follow-up? Yeah, just to provide some additional context, having been involved in other negotiations in jurisdictions outside of Ontario, this is a common practice to sign non-disclosure agreements. And in addition to that, this government has uh, essentially gone through an NDA process with every stakeholder that's come to the table. So I, I think that throughout this process, having signed the NDA, having come with real solutions as alternatives to what was originally proposed, we have developed a trusted relationship. 
And now we are a recognized influencer to be at the table to shape uh, the solutions as things evolve over the next two to three years. And that'll be our single priority on uh, a new agreement. Thanks, Justin. Uh, actually, Justin, my next question would be to you. Uh, so we've just heard a lot about what has gone on over the past past seven months. Um, how would you sum it all up? You know, in terms of because I know we we have other items that we want to talk about on on this webinar. How would you sum up where we're at right now? Mm -hmm. Well, I think there's certainly uh, we're we're disappointed that we've had to go through a process over the last six months that is mitigating against uh, reductions to pharmacy and pharmacists. Uh, that said, the opportunity now is to pivot. What is our vision? What is the next steps in order to not be in this cycle every two years uh, with every new mandate of government? And that is where we need to come together, come together as associations, unite uh, around a, a, common, a common theme, which is we need a sustainable reimbursement framework. We need a long-term agreement that gets us out of this uh, constant uncertainty, uh, unpredictability, and we need to ensure that we're valued for the services that uh, we can demonstrate that value with research uh, of the services and the, um, the, the value we have to patients. And I think part of that is telling our story. We don't do enough of that from a grassroots perspective on the value of the patient uh, pharmacist interaction and, and ultimately how we are part of a solution to create capacity in the healthcare system. A lot of what we're doing is aligned with this government's policy objectives from a business perspective in terms of reducing red tape, being open for business, having a competitive landscape, but also from uh, looking at alternative levels of care uh, uh, and, and certainly serving patients closer to where they live, work and play is going to be a critical part of that. We can't do that unless we are at the table. And, and I think we've increased our profile and credibility to come forward with solutions over the next two years. And ultimately we have big active files in play right now when it comes to ordinary commercial terms that are of uh, significance, uh, private label generics that were tabled uh, as regulatory uh, process back in November, and uh, also looking at uh, the process through the enhanced uh, scope of practice. So that's a natural, actually a natural segue into our next section of this webinar, and that is uh, last week, uh, beginning was early last week, the ministry also announced another regulatory consultation. Uh, this one, though, on uh, in essence, re helping to reduce the administrative burden on, on pharmacies, uh, amongst others, but uh, reducing some of that red tape that we are just so, uh, so used to. What can you tell us about that, that new regulatory consultation, that new process? What's, what's the government looking at? So our, we, the industry actually came together, Alan, uh, back in, uh, in the summer to uh, align around a proposal that would see the removal of the ordinary commercial terms cap at 10%, completely removed, um, along with the introduction with some changes to the original draft regulations of the private label generics. And I think that's important because it aligns Ontario with the other provinces. It allows for a, a level playing field uh, for independence. Uh, and it also, uh, it gets government out of uh, a lot of the, the business of, of pharmacy. Um, where we're at right now is the 25% that was introduced is certainly not what we asked for. It's not a reduction in, in red tape. So we definitely need to align the industry around uh, uh, flooding the registry to remove the 25% the cap is being uh, proposed in the reg regulation. So today, with ordinary commercial terms, we are permitted uh, up to 10% of volume discounts. That was introduced by the previous government. Um, that is not aligned with how the other provinces uh, operate. And it is red tape by definition. So our proposal has been very consistent back uh, in November when we did the submission when private label uh, was first introduced, which is to say, if you're going to do private label, you need to do the corresponding change to that 10% and remove the cap altogether. Our position has always been that government regulates a fair and reasonable price, uh, and it is up to the uh, trading partners uh, based on common practice and best practices to determine how to share that. Um, and we think that that is uh, an integral part of level leveling the playing field, uh, creating fair competition, 
and uh, getting us out of some of the administrative burden that is placed on, on pharmacies. So beyond, uh, beyond ordinary commercial terms, uh, and I appreciate that, that that's a, a term that is certainly well known to pharmacy owners and managers, but may not be as well understood by pharmacists. But uh, there are other, I think there were some other issues that were addressed in that um, administrative burden and that red tape reduction uh, consultation. Um, Jen, I think one of them was with regards to uh, reversals uh, of, um, of claims. This would be music to, I think, most practicing pharmacists ears when it comes to the administrative burden of trying to reverse an ODB claim that is older than seven days old, um, especially when it comes to managing workflow often for chronic medications. You look at um, prescriptions that are dispensed uh, in, in advance of perhaps when they're due due to work, uh, workflow planning. Um, ultimately, sometimes patients call in a prescription, they don't pick it up immediately. We all, as pharmacists, we, we know this scenario all too well. They come in, something's wrong with the claim and we need to reverse it. And it's been longer than seven days and we can't do it. And it needs to be done via paper claim. And the administrative burden associated with that is absolutely massive. So this, uh, this proposal would extend that window from seven to 90 days. Um, I can't hear anyone on the line, but I, I, I know that there's a collective cheer being raised um, on, on the line here because that would uh, very much um, reduce the workload on pharmacists who are trying to reverse those ODB claims. This is something that we've been advocating for for years. Um, much longer, I believe, than I've been on the board. Um, and it's something that we're, uh, we would be very excited to see come to fruition. It's, you know, it, it's not nearly as exciting as something like expanded scope from, um, from a profile perspective, but when it comes to the day-to-day the -day nuts and bolts of, of operating a pharmacy, uh, this, this would be a huge, uh, huge improvement to our workplace. Thanks, Jen. Um, Justin, there was also some mention in that uh, consultation about uh, changes in terms of how the ministry is going to look at drug shortages. Can you expand a little bit on that? Yes, thanks, Alan. I think it's really to free up the both the movement of uh, products between the tiers of the tiered pricing uh, that is federally negotiated of the Pancane Pricing Alliance or Pharmaceutical Alliance and allows Ontario to provide the short-term public funding as well through the exemption of certain drug submission requirements for clinically appropriate alternative drugs that are not currently funded. So that is a recognition of both the value and, and some of the gaps that exist today in the, in the system. So just before we, uh, we turn things over to uh, our participants to start looking at some of the questions, um, what are, what are we looking ahead at now? What's uh, what's our what's downstream for us? Well, I think when we started at the outset of this call, we talked about our strategic approach to negotiate a short-term agreement to provide that runway and develop the relationship with government to advance a more sustainable framework for the profession. And I think there's really several uh, aspects to this. The first is we need to have a recognition and acknowledgement that we need to engage the college and our, our community partners on uh, some of the support, the infrastructure and the apparatus around uh, how we deliver the services in the community. And I think that also starts with uh, looking at the existing programs. How do we maximize uh, the scope of practice that we have today in a consistent and quality manner? Uh, and how are we measuring that um, and, and demonstrating our value in terms of uh, care outcomes and being a partner in uh, the overall healthcare system? I think funding for scope is, is critical. So as we work with the college around regulatory impact assessment, uh, looking at utilization uh, and what will be included in that, uh, we need to ensure that it's uh, appropriately funded. Uh, and ultimately we need to uh, ensure that what's being implemented is done so in a way that doesn't introduce uh, unintended consequences because there is a recognition that we may have to make adjustments both to the reconciliation method and also to better understand the impacts in long-term care. I think one of the challenges that we had, Alan, uh, in, in the long-term care sector when we were engaging government and liaising with our long-term care partners uh, was that the Auditor General's report came out a couple of years ago and highlighted that Ontario funds it four times more than any other province. And, and we, we collectively had a challenge in coming up with 
any evidence that would demonstrate that we're giving four times the outcomes. So we recognize that there are regulatory uh, framework differences between BC and Ontario and some of the other comparator uh, provinces, but we do need to ensure that from a resident standpoint, um, that there isn't any negative impact or an intended consequence. And I know the government's very committed to that and liaising with us through that ongoing monitoring and evaluation framework. But we can't rest on uh, the fact that uh, we have two years. We look east to our partners in Quebec who have developed a framework that's very modern in terms of the, uh, the reimbursement model, in a tiered type format based on complexity of patient and medication. And there's definitely going to be a need to ensure that as we undertake this transformation from what is purely a, a transactional model to one that is a hybrid model with services that we support pharmacists, that we have not only the education, but the tools uh, and, uh, and the appropriate compensation to deliver on this commitment to uh, be more involved in primary care, more involved in harm reduction, and public health, in addition to optimizing medication management. Well, one of our challenges continues to be that we're siloed into the drug budget. And with the creation of Ontario Health and the Ontario Health teams, we believe there is an opportunity to re-examine how and what envelopes uh, we get paid for, whether it's through primary care or other mechanisms, because much of what we do, the benefits accrue to multiple parts of the healthcare system, but we don't necessarily get uh, you know, recognize for that. And, uh, you know, like any drug budget, they're looking at year over year increases as utilization goes up with our aging demographic, uh, new medicines, um, and certainly the biologic high cost drug side. So there's, there's multiple ways that we can work with government. Uh, certainly biosimilars is another area where we need to be at the table. I think we have a constructive relationship now. We have, uh, we have to move forward. We have to have that uh, vision so that in two years, we have a, a pharmacy agreement. I would offer up that if you look at the jurisdictions across Canada that don't have a pharmacy agreement in some form or another, those that do it through regulation and policy, they're the ones that are lagging behind, uh, both in funding and in scope of practice. So I do think it's time that we do this uh, in a united fashion. We do have to work with our partners, both on the uh, operational side and pharmacies, as well as the profession. There is a symbiotic relationship there although we fully acknowledge there are issues that need to be addressed directly from a practice standpoint and trying to optimize that uh, and, and measure everything that we do. So, but, but we have to do this together. Uh, we can't completely separate the two. Uh, and I think that's why our partnerships with other associations, as well as surveying and listening to our members and coming up with solutions is gonna be very critical. So I think to summarize what Justin said is there is, uh, as always, a lot coming at us down the pipeline. And ultimately, in order to, to influence our future, we need to be at that table. And the Ontario Pharmacists Association is, is probably the only group um, that all pharmacists in Ontario could belong to and have a voice in. Um, and we are one of those chosen partners of government to negotiate moving forward. Uh, we look at um, some of the uh, the other consultations, like the um, the national one on pharmacare, and we don't see pharmacists at the table. We know that having pharmacists at the table is essential for good outcomes in our profession. Um, so ultimately, we 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 need you, our members, uh, to continue to support us in in trying to move this profession forward. Um, as pharmacists, it's, a, it's part of our personal identity and we're all very passionate. And uh, you know, we do very much appreciate the support of our members um, and, and hearing your voices uh, on, on these items to put forward to government and represent you at that level. Okay, thank, thank you both Justin and Jen for uh, that, that first round of, uh, of this, this webinar. We'd like, now like to uh, take a stab at addressing some of the many questions that have come in. Uh, so without any further ado, I'm going to basically read, read some of these questions and I'll ask our panelists to uh, provide any comment. Uh, Jen, first one I'm, I'm going to throw out um, for you is actually relating to the MedCheck program. Mm -hmm. The question is, uh, are we basically looking at status quo for MedCheck over the next three plus years? Um, I guess, you know, in, in, in we know that, that the, the discussions between OPA, neighborhood pharmacies, and the government uh, did uh, identify that the 
uh, that the program or that the proposals that are still to be ratified, I should note that all of these are still to be ratified by government, um, but uh, that this is an interim measure and that we're looking at, as Justin had said, a longer term, uh, a longer term strategy. So from MedCheck, what, you know, we have maybe a three year window, what, what then? So, um, yes, ultimately, we do have a three-year window. I believe our agreement um, expires in March of 2023, um, where there's that commitment to keep the meds check program um, at status quo. Uh, we, we will be doing a lot of work in terms of looking at the meds check program to determine how it will still provide the value to patients uh, while streamlining it for pharmacies so that it's uh, it's able to provide that value that true value rather than being more of an exercise in documentation so we recognize that there are challenges with the status quo however that will be maintained while we work together and have that time to to propose something um, that will work better both for the pharmacies, for the patients, and for the government when it comes to the documentation. Thank you, Jen. Next question is for Justin. Um, Justin, uh, the question is, how did government rationalize removing payments by lumping them into the capitation model and yet still push for pharmacists to deprescribe? Thanks for the question. I would say really the genesis of this came from the Auditor General's report two years ago, which highlighted capitation as a solution to uh, deliver on not only care outcomes, uh, but certainly looking at um, the costs uh, and, and comparing it to as an outlier, comparing it to other jurisdictions. Um, I think, you know, the minister's comments were certainly indicative of maybe perhaps a lack of understanding that pharmacists don't prescribe. So having a capitation model isn't going to necessarily translate into less prescriptions, but, but there certainly is a uh, opportunity to look at PPIs, look at antipsychotics in long-term care residents. Uh, and certainly I think pharmacists have a greater role to play in medication management uh, and that is an opportunity we want to continue the dialogue with this government around scope of practice things like deprescribing and other mechanisms you know i go back on this one uh, even four or five years ago when when alan and i were sitting with the ministry in a working group with long-term care uh, homes and physicians uh, where we looked at a separate formulary for long-term care we looked at a number of uh, uh, mechanisms to increase the value and uh, and certainly look at measuring those health outcomes. So, I mean, there is precedent for that in, in Alberta and some other jurisdictions, and I think we need to explore those uh, mechanisms to deliver on the commitment of delivering for value for money from a government perspective, but also ensuring that residents have the, the right medications at the right time. Maybe, thanks, Justin. And maybe as a just a quick follow-up, uh, because we did uh, see this question come up a couple of times. Um, there's a question in terms of how does, what does a capitation model, how does a capitation model work? Um, and what if a patient is, uh, what if a patient stay in a long-term care home is less than a year? Uh, how does that work in the context of, of what the government is, is looking at? So what's being proposed is it's a per bed fee, not a per resident fee. So for an annual uh, payment model of 1500 starting at $1,500, uh, that fee is inclusive of everything uh, outside of markup. So any professional services, dispensing fees uh, would include that. And we expect that to be uh, paid on a monthly basis. Uh, and that's the model that's been put in place in jurisdictions like Manitoba and BC. So anything above and beyond that would uh, would be uh, not uh, reimbursed. Um, so that includes the meds check for long-term care um, and any of the other uh, services. And I think that's where we want to make sure we monitor the impact um, and understand the uh, uh, how it's being implemented and operationalized in the homes because there's obviously there's codependency in the current model with homes and uh, long-term care pharmacy providers. Thank you, Justin. Um, next question goes back to um, the back to the MedCheck program. Uh, I'm going to ask both of you to comment on this. Um, I'll ask Jan first. Is is OPA planning on taking any action on evaluating the MedCheck program so that it's not at risk of being cut again? Uh, 
Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, you know, one of the essential parts of this agreement moving forward is that we are engaged um, in evaluating the program, demonstrating the value, uh, making suggestions around operationalization uh, to ensure that it's feasible for pharmacies. So, um, you know, I think the, the quick answer to that is, is yes. Um, and, you know, ultimately what that specifically looks like um, I can't speak to as of yet because that will still evolve as we as we look to to set that course moving forward but um, absolutely 100% that is something that we're committed to um, in this process. Justin? It's been uh, an area of our concern for some time where there was a working group with the previous government I think certainly addressing the documentation challenges, perhaps introduce some unnecessary burdens, but uh, there, there's no question that we need to make sure that we're measuring the right outcomes, that we can demonstrate the value of the program, and we have to do it in an, a, an appropriate manner so that it's quality and consistency in that, that quality. Because there is a perception issue, and I would even offer up that uh, perhaps a, a, a new name for it would even be uh, necessary for us to add on to it because I know that the, the foundational pieces of the program are certainly valuable but there are there is a, a recognition that we need to improve and enhance and look at other opportunities where uh, this could be applicable uh, and better utilized. Thank you Justin. Next question is uh, a bit of a, a, a shift but it does relate to scope of practice. Uh, the question is relating to common ailments in particular how is how are common ailments going to be rolled out? And do we have any insights in terms of what the funding model might be for this? Um, Justin, do you want to take a quick stab at that one and Jen can comment? Sure. I, I mean, there is precedent. Uh, you know, Ontario is certainly one of the uh, remaining, last few remaining jurisdictions that haven't implemented a minor ailments program or common ailments, uh, as it's often referred to. I would say that uh, the Saskatchewan model is one that... Uh, looks at a number of conditions, there's over 20 now. Um, a large part of this will be part of the consultation process with uh, the Ontario College of Pharmacists. And uh, in terms of um, looking at it from the perspective of payment, you know, we're certainly advocating for an assessment fee. And the result of that could be uh, OTC counseling, uh, referral to uh, a hospital or other uh, clinician and or uh, prescription. So. I think that's an important element of it. The minister is on the record uh, at a press conference back in the spring, uh, suggesting that uh, there would be a payment to pharmacists for doing this work. And they wouldn't expect this to be done uh, without some form of compensation. At this point, we haven't, uh, I would say, negotiated that price, uh, but that is certainly a part of what uh, will be our ongoing dialogue. And now that we have this formalized structure with government where we are at the table, uh, scope of practice, I mentioned on the outset, is, is a huge part of this and uh, will be one of our priorities moving forward. Yeah. I think just to to add one additional comment to that, um, when we, uh, you know, I, I talked about the um, ODB reversal, claims reversal uh, timeline and how long we've been advocating for that, common ailments is another file uh, on which there has been tireless advocacy uh, over the last at least 10 years um, and ultimately has not happened quickly. Um, very few things with government do or can, but uh, there has been that continued push for this because we see the value to, um, to the patient and to the profession. And I'm very excited to see this finally enabled, um, that commitment here in Ontario so that we can catch up with our scope of practice uh, to, uh, to our colleagues across the country. Thank you, Jen. Uh, just before we get into the next question, I do want to remind uh, everyone who's on the line uh, that we are getting, uh, there's a lot of questions coming in around some of the details associated with the rollout of both the reconciliation uh, framework as well as uh, the capitation model for long-term care. Uh, I mentioned briefly uh, that, first of all, there, there is still a formal uh, process for th these proposals to be formally ratified by uh, by the government. Uh, we expect that to be happening uh, at any time and with implementation for both the reconciliation framework and the capitation model uh, at, uh, to occur on January 1st of 2020. Uh, so with regards to a lot of deta the details, there aren't a lot 
Uh, I will refer people to the OPA website. We are continually fielding questions uh, from, from members, trying to post the, the answers to those questions where we have them onto the OPA website in, in a frequently asked questions section. Uh, recognizing though that there are still some questions where the details aren't available, we are conferring continually with the ministry to get answers to these questions. And again, these will be, these questions and these details will be provided through the FAQ section on the OPA website. Uh, the next question is relating to, uh, goes back to the reconciliation process. And there's a question, uh, and maybe Justin, you can take a stab at this. What does up to 16% uh, reduction mean uh, the the up to piece and and I presume the same would be said for the four percent for medications under a thousand dollars. In other words, when will and will there ever be a set percentage? Thanks. No, I would say that the the, the concept will be negotiated, which you're seeing reflected in the regs, is that there's a maximum amount. So the up to means that at no time can that reconciliation percentage for claims above a thousand. Uh, surpass 16%, same for claims below 1,000 would not surpass the 4%. What we have been able to achieve is that uh, we will be able to adjust those percentages based on utilization and the uh, analysis on a monthly basis of what uh, the actuals are. So right now, based on the ODB data, that's the uh, amount that is targeted. Uh, but sitting with the, the table and looking at the actual impacts, we'll be able to adjust those accordingly. Justin, I think the next question is gonna be aimed at you. Uh, although Jen, you may have had some experience in this as well. Do we have any other examples of other health professions uh, uh, getting uh, or being subject to, uh, to funding cuts? Well, I think it's, it's, it's an interesting question. It's one I hear often, uh, and, and it's not an apples to apples comparison to compare pharmacists to uh, healthcare providers that are within the public system, employees of the state, or quasi employees of the state, if you're looking at physicians as small businesses, but a single payer model. Um, we're unique in that respect that we are both in the private system, both private insurance plans, as well as cash paying customers, and operating within the public plan. and and the majority of pharmacists are uh, either employees or consultants with uh, with multiple different uh, employers being involved in this. So, uh, you know, this this idea around unionization and, and how we would negotiate is very different than it would be for uh, nurses, let's say, or physicians. So we have to level set on that that it's not a, a fair comparator. I would say that yes, there's. Uh, if you talk to the OMA and you look at the last uh, five years, there was uh, attempts at uh, curtailing uh, payment to physicians. There's a number of initiatives on transparency as well to physician billings. Um, and, uh, but the difference here, and it's a, it's a difference that is, is very important for us to emphasize, is that where we become a soft target is having that grassroots support, the sympathy of the public um, as part of the public healthcare system. And that is a lever that those uh, groups have that we do not as pharmacy. And we need to build that, uh, we need to build that uh, uh, and mobilize on that and, and tell our story in a different way. But we don't have the same leverage points and it's just the reality of our, our situation. So we have to tackle this from a slightly different perspective. But uh, you know, what comes to mind is physicians uh, and, and there's other groups too. If you look at optometrists and look at delisting of services in certain areas, uh, across the continuum, there has been uh, some examples where government is either cut funding or not funding at all um, in, the, in the case of some uh, healthcare providers. I think too, just uh, to also comment on the complexity of it, when we look at um, you know, how pharmacist services in Ontario are funded, we're funded through the Ontario Drug Benefit Budget, um, whereas there are other budgets that fund other healthcare providers. So uh, our services are tied into a uh, pool of money that is um, affected by the cost of product and the cost of drug. Uh, as we're seeing the cost of drugs um, increase at uh, you know, an astounding rate um, as we get into some of the highly specialized treatments that are available to, to patients, um, we see pressure on pharmacy services payments. And, and that's 
a byproduct of, of how our services are funded. So as part of a, a model moving forward, uh, it is something that needs to be looked at is, you know, are pharmacy services part of primary care and, you know, in an attempt to discuss apples to apples, when we talk about the value of things like common common ailments prescribing in pharmacies, it uh, becomes very challenging because we're, we're talking to different departments about different pools of money. Um, and there are a lot of working parts and complexities when it comes to that as well, too. So I wanted to point out that additional level of complexity when it comes to comparing pharmacy cuts against those of other professions. But we do know that there has been that widespread commitment to finding savings to, to attempt to reduce Ontario's deficit. Justin um, and Jen, we have about five minutes left. So uh, we will uh, continue to ask questions right up until seven o'clock. Uh, Justin, I'm gonna throw uh, an interesting question at you. Uh, particularly as a new CEO for OPA, it would be good for you. Uh, the question is, please tell me as a long-term care pharmacist, why I should support you? It's a great question. It's not one that I haven't heard before. So that's why I think it's important to address and, and be very clear and transparent that during this process, we took a very balanced perspective. We went into government to represent all stakeholders, including long-term care uh, consulting pharmacists and those in the community. There was at no time did we look at sacrificing any sector for the other. And that's part of uh, our ongoing commitment is to represent risks and introduce uh, alternatives to government that would be both sustainable uh, for the profession as well as deliver value for government. And, you know, at the end of the day, these are not our ideas. We did not come up with a capitation model, nor did we come up with um, the other mechanisms that were introduced in the budget process. What we need to change is the uh, finger pointing and the uh, you know, the suggestion that somehow, you know, we did not represent people uh, fairly uh, throughout this process. We offered a, a, a risk management approach for long-term care that ultimately was rejected by the long-term care coalition for reasons that, uh, you know, they felt were, were germane to what they're doing. Uh, and that's part of you know, the negotiation process. And in any negotiation, you're going to have to achieve some compromise. That's the a byproduct of negotiating. Um, we will continue to support all pharmacists in all settings, and in particular, we will be paying uh, attention to and monitoring what happens as this gets operationalized and, and advocating on your behalf. I want to say that we worked very closely with long-term care pharmacy providers throughout this uh, process. We used comparators to the care model, the regulatory environment, uh, studies on uh, you know, frequency of dispensing and the value of weekly dispensing. Uh, I myself have been in those uh, care settings, both at the homes and in preparation with the drugs in the strip. So I have a, an appreciation for the difference in the workflow and operating environment. Um, so it's, it is a priority for us. It will continue to be a priority for us to uh, make sure we're representing all stakeholders when we uh, liaise with government. But at the end of the day, uh, a deal had to be made or it would have been much worse. And even on the long-term care side, um, our intervention saved uh, what was the original proposal to where we are today, including removing the copay, um, which ultimately we feel uh, provided value at the, uh, uh, in the final details. Thank you. Um, I think we may have time for one or two more questions. Uh, this is another um, interesting one. Um, I'm going to throw this to you, Jen. There are a few questions coming in online uh, that are suggestive that Justin Bates, as our new CEO, does not represent pharmacists. Would you like to comment on that? Well, I think, um, you know, Justin is not a pharmacist. So I, that's, that's a fact. However, he spent the better part of two decades advocating on behalf of pharmacy and pharmacists. And while recognizing that he may not have a degree in pharmacy or, or be registered with the Ontario College of Pharmacists. Um, I, I can personally assert that he is just as passionate, if not more so than, than many of us um, and, and, and most people within this building here at OPA. Um, the, the board chose Justin to be the new CEO of the Ontario Pharmacists Association because of his exceptional performance in pharmacy advocacy for an alternative organization. Uh, we feel very lucky and privileged to have him here and he's done excellent work for on behalf of pharmacy. Um, 
in my role as chair, I've had the privilege of working alongside of him since he started. And, uh, you know, I don't know if uh, how good my word is to you out there, but I, I can personally assert that um, he has the, uh, the best interests of, of pharmacists and pharmacy in Ontario at heart in everything he does. Um, and I, I truly believe you don't need to be um, a good, or uh, sorry, a pharmacist to be a good CEO, um, because ultimately you just need to care about the pharmacy profession. You need to be competent in your job, and you need to want to do what's right for patients in Ontario. And Just Bates checks all three of those those boxes. Uh, I will use my, uh, I guess, as the last comment before we tie things up. I want to thank, first of all, everyone for, for their questions, but I do want to add my, uh, my two cents to Jen's comment. Um, and I go back 14 years uh, to when I actually hired Justin into the world of pharmacy. And uh, I am absolutely thrilled to have Justin uh, bringing his passion, his expertise, uh, his knowledge of the industry, his knowledge of government, his knowledge of stakeholders, uh, and his long-term vision to OPA. Uh, I have uh, nothing but uh, tremendous respect for everything that Justin has done over the course of his uh, 14 years in pharmacy. Uh, yes, he's not a pharmacist, uh, but he bleeds pharmacy like I do, like Jen does, uh, and we in the association have uh, the utmost confidence in Justin's leadership moving forward. So with that, uh, we are at 7.01. Uh, we are unfortunately one minute over. Uh, uh, Jen, you have one final comment you'd like to make? I do. And uh, I would be remiss if I let this webinar end without thanking on behalf of the board of directors for OPA, the tireless work done by OPA staff on this file. Uh, advocacy work is often thankless. Uh, I know lots of long hours were, uh, were logged on these files. And um, well, not all may agree with me. I, I believe that this is the best possible outcome in this scenario and that we have a lot to, to hope for um, in looking forward at the ability to work with government on bettering the profession and looking at new opportunities. So I would just like to extend my heartfelt appreciation to everyone within the Ontario Pharmacists Association staff for all the work they've done on this. Um, and with that, I think we can, we can say good night for the evening. Thank you, everyone. Uh, please uh, watch over the next couple of days. We will be posting this webinar uh, as well as any questions that we're not able to get answered uh, in the hour. Uh, we will continue to post our answers to our FAQ section on the website. Uh, and if you still have any questions uh, that have not been uh, asked this evening and you would like to continue to bring them forward, uh, I would ask you to send them to communications at opainfo.com. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a pleasant evening.